Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a family portrait ranked video. So I've been going back and ranking some of my family portraits, as you guys know, and I've knocked out most of the houses that I have large bottle collections in. So we've already done Creed, uh, Guerlain, Amouage, Roja, and today we're doing YSL, okay? Uh, and YSL uh, is a house that was basically founded in the early 1960s, 1962 to be exact. Uh, and they became uh, very popular for the rise of uh, democratization in fashion. Basically, uh, they became popular for this uh, ready-to-wear. They began producing this ready-to-wear design idea, which uh, you have to understand that uh, back in the fashion days, which us perfume lovers usually don't pay uh, so much attention to the fashion side of things. But back in the day, you know, these luxury houses, many of them didn't focus on ready to wear. Basically, you go to the store and you buy a size that's pre-cut. Uh, they focused on, um, you know, making cuts and tailors for the people who would buy up the uh, product and then take it to their own personal tailor and have it tailored for them. That's what the uber rich did back then. Ready to wear was for the masses, you know, they thought they looked down on ready to wear. So having a high end line like Yves Saint Laurent come out and really um, popularize the concept was a big deal back then. And they did some other things. They um, were very popular for what was called the beatnik look, which was safari jackets, tight pants, uh, thigh high boots, you know, stuff like that. In 1960, since they, in 1966, they debuted Le Smoking, which was a tuxedo suit for women. Uh, and of course, going into the 70s and 80s, they really fashion, they fashioned the um, broad shoulder padded suits for women, which when we look back today at that period, it's kind of laughable, but that's what was fun. That was, that's what was, uh, you know, popular back then. I almost said that's what was funny back then. That is what was funny back then. Uh, but uh, I love looking at the old fashion and it's always funny how uh, you know, what used to be popular, if you wait, usually a generation, usually every 20 or 30 years, fashion turns over and what was unpopular becomes popular. So the good news is if you have a closet full of unpopular stuff, if you wait long enough, it will eventually become popular again. So there you go. Um, but anyways, long story short is this is going to be on my bottle collection from YSL. I have 15 fragrances we're going to talk about today. So as you can see, you know, the fragrances are kind of getting smaller and smaller and smaller in, in size. The collections are getting smaller, let's say. And I have way more than 15 fragrances because this is a line that I have multiple backups of. Uh, there are four bottles of one, four bottles of another, three bottles of another. So some of these are... Uh, some of my favorite fragrances of all time. And to be fair, you know, for me, YSL was one of the uh, big design, the big designer houses. Now, I don't consider them to be a powerhouse anymore. They've really fallen off of the cliff or they've crashed into the side of the mountain. You know, if you prefer the uh, Big Lebowski euphemism, the plane has crashed into the side of the mountain for YSL or now as their fashion side is known, Saint Laurent. Uh, Heidi Slimane, who made the rounds, you know, he was one of the um, uh, collections and art directors at many of the big houses, um, you know, YSL in 1997, I think he was appointed to YSL's creative di uh, art director is what they call it, collections and art director. He then left to go to Dior, where he created the Dior Online, which is so popular in perfume. Uh, and then he left again, I think now he's with, um, now he's with, uh, Celine, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's with Celine and you know what he basically did while, when he, after, um, the man Yves Saint Laurent passed away in 2008 of brain cancer is he actually dropped the Eve. Yves, Yves Saint Laurent, the Eve and Yves Saint Laurent was dropped on the fashion side to Saint Laurent. So if you ever hear these rappers and they're like, Saint Laurent, you know, that's what they're, that's what they're uh, talking about. 
Uh, probably many of them have no idea of the backstory of the of the brand or the company. They just see Saint Laurent, and and that's what they talk about in their rap songs. But um, so he dropped that for marketing purposes because I think uh, whenever they launched the Rive Gauche line, it was Saint Laurent Rive Gauche, and so Hattie Slamane took um, took inspiration from that. And um, right now, YSL is going through some serious birthing pains and, well, not even birthing pains, but they're going through almost like a death throw because their cosmetics line is owned by L'Oreal. And L'Oreal, I don't really feel like takes good care of the uh, fragrance creations. I don't. I mean, personally, they discontinued Koros uh, in the United States, which is a tra travesty. Many of their uh, reformulations are not good, in my opinion. Uh, whereas I think Estee Lauder takes better care of their fragrances. And I think they give their houses more f creative freedom. You know, I feel like Estee Lauder gives brands like Frederick Mall and Tom Ford space to breathe, space to be their own, um, you know, brand and, and really showcase who they are and... You know, if it means spending a little more money here or doing this a little bit there on the design side or marketing side, I feel like they give them a little bit more space. Whereas I feel like L'Oreal just comes in and they're like, you guys, that's it. We're taking over. We're, we're taking over control. And, and they just kind of chop everything down to the bare bones. And I don't like that at all. I L'Oreal is probably my least favorite, you know, large conglomerate to own many of these houses. But okay, enough waffling. It's been six minutes and 42 seconds and we haven't even talked about a perfume. So this is going to be a top 15 with one bonus fragrance. And the reason that the bonus fragrance is a bonus fragrance is that I don't wear it. It's actually my wife's fragrance. Uh, it's hers, but it is in the collection and I did buy it for her. Uh, but this is uh, YSL... Libre uh, Eau de Parfum. Okay, so there's the packaging. And the bottle has this uh, very gaudy YSL uh, gold structure going across the front of it. There it is right there. Uh, y YSL, very, very gaudy bottle. And, you know, it's a decent fragrance. It was created by Carlos Benaim. And it has a lot of orange blossom, Moroccan orange blossom and jasmine. Um, this is the Eau de Parfum, which I think is a little bit different than the Eau de Toilette. The Eau de Parfum came out in 2019. The Eau de Parfum actually came out first, to be fair. So this has Moroccan uh, orange blossom absolute with neroli, two very bright, fresh flowers with jasmine sambac absolute. Interestingly enough, there is a French lavender note in here, which kind of shocked me. Uh, when I first kind of got to know this fragrance a little bit as far as like a fragrance lover getting to know the fragrance, not just smelling it on my wife. Um, but like most mainstream fragrances nowadays, there's a huge slug of bourbon vanilla and it is extremely sweet. They say there's ambergris in the base, which is probably ambroxan and cedar and musk. And so for me, it's not a bad fragrance. It's just extremely sweet and Honestly, I think I like Aventus for her on my wife better, but uh, she likes this one and it does smell good on her to be fair, but it's not something that I would wear. It's extremely typically, you know, modern floral, sweet, feminine fragrance with a touch of orange in the top. So uh, not not bad, but uh, this is the kind of stuff that the House of YSL is putting out nowadays. So that's the honorable mention. Let's do scent of the day before we get into the top 15. And scent of the day is actually a uh, amber fragrance. It's a spicy resinous amber that was created by Cecile Zerokian back in 2014. And it's from the house of uh, Mask Milano. And this is actually the only Mask Milano in my collection. And it's only a 10 ml decan. It's not even a full bottle. Actually, I do have a sample someone sent me of Latessa, which I'll talk about on the on the channel soon. Because I hear that's an amazing iris. Um, but this is Tango. Uh, the juice color is beautiful. The fragrance is not bad. I mean, the first couple minutes or maybe even the first five minutes are extremely spicy, spicy overdose, almost to the point where I don't like it uh, because it opens up with a lot of pepper, a lot of cardamom, and a lot of cumin, and it all just kind of comes together at once. You know, there's no, it uh, doesn't feel like it's balanced very well. The first five minutes. 
Then it goes into this, you know, this fragrance kind of goes through these phases for me where it feels unbalanced and it feels balanced and it feels unbalanced again uh, because it starts off unbalanced with that heavy, you know, spice, very off-putting. But if you give it five, ten minutes at the most, it kind of settles into this beautiful, spicy, rosy amber is basically what it settles into. But the problem is, is the more it dries down, the more it just kind of turns into this sweeter, powdery, ambery fragrance with slight leather touches. And I like my fragrances the other way around. I like heavy leather touches with slight amber or heavy leather with slight amber touches. Uh, there is some, you know, sweet vanilla in the base uh, and tonka. The ingredients feel middle of the road. Uh, they don't feel of the highest quality like you would expect from an expensive niche house, but they also don't seem cheap either. Um, and so I like it enough to own a decant and wear occasionally, especially when it's cold. Today was in the 40s. It's going to get down to freezing tonight in Texas. And so uh, this is the kind of stuff I like to wear once a year. You know what I mean? Like I get my Tango Fix and that's it. Kind of like Grand Soir. I wear a Grand Soir once a year and, and that's it. Um, but I'll do a video on this. I will wear this again and talk about it, and this will be the topic of a video in full, full review one day. Okay, so let's move on to the top 15 from YSL. So number one, or actually I should say number 15 on the list since we're doing a countdown, is actually from uh, YSL's premium brand, believe it or not. The only fragrance in my collection, and it's a decant, thank God it's not a full bottle, uh, from the uh, premium brand, if you will is um, is uh, the lowest on the list. How's that for a dichotomy? But uh, this came out in 2015. It was released by uh, Juliet Caraguezaglu. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Caraguezaglu. And uh, this is called Tuxedo. So, um, Tuxedo is hyped in the mainstream fragrance community, if you will. And this is like $260 or $280 a bottle. What an absolute ripoff. This smells like a cheap designer to me uh, with slight touches of violet leaf. Of course, nothing to offend. We couldn't offend anyone, right? We have to keep everything perfectly, you know, just a uh, slight violet leaf. We wouldn't want anyone to think about Fahrenheit or anything. No, no, no. You know, so very slight violet leaf with mostly it turns into this patchouli bourbon vanilla, this patchouli vanilla, and that's it. They claim there's ambergris in the base. Doesn't smell like there's real ambergris in the base. Uh, it smells like there's probably just that, you know, same level of ambroxin that you get in something like Sauvage. Uh, and it's a little bit peppery. It's a little bit floral. And that's pretty much it. Lots of, lots of boring designer vanilla with um, a patchouli that honestly does nothing for me. It's, um, I, I, I just don't understand how stuff like this gets so hyped in the fragrance community. I mean, uh, again, I have a 10 ml decant. I will do a full review, but this doesn't seem, you know, I'm like scrolling through the comments real quick and it's like gentlemanly, refinement, classy, elegant. I don't get any of that. I just get cheap, designer, overpriced, way overpriced. This should be like 50 bucks, max. They're selling this for almost $300. What a joke. Tuxedo is a joke, and that's the most hyped from the line. Their niche line is a mess, an absolute mess. So um, Tuxedo comes in at number 15. Number 14 is discontinued. You're gonna see a lot of discontinued fragrances on this list, unfortunately. Um, number 14 comes in, uh, and it's a Pierre Bourdon. And, you know, I had a hard time placing this, if you will, because I do really like this. And one thing I will say is even though I don't have a lot of YSL fragrances, the ones that I have, I absolutely love. So starting from here, everything on is, is a, is a high like, okay? If not a love, high like, if not a love. Um, and so even though this is number 14, this is an amazing fragrance to wear in the heat in the summer. You know, you wear this once or twice a year when it's 100 degrees and it is perfect. It is a perfect, you know, um, late uh, career Pierre Bourdon creation. 
and it's a flanker. It's actually the second flanker of this fragrance, and it's called Live Jazz. So you can see right there, Live Jazz. Uh, absolutely beautiful bottle. I love these bottles. And uh, this is a Sanofi. So interestingly enough, um, Sanofi purchased uh, Yves Saint Laurent. Sanofi was a pharmaceutical company in 1993. Uh, Sanofi purchased Yves Saint Laurent. And Yves Saint Laurent um, went through multiple phases. So basically, the Yves Saint Laurent, the man, had lots of problems during his life. He lived the rock star life, let's say. And he uh, got caught up in rich people problems, rock star problems. I mean, he had a drug addiction, which was well known about. Uh, you know, he was just a walking billboard for do not do drugs kids, you know. Uh, and they ran into a money problem. Rumor was going on that he was kind of pilfering money from the company to support his drug habit. And all of this rumor started to come out. And there's an entire history on the House of YSL that we could maybe talk about one day, uh, but it won't be this video, you know, basically starting with, um, you know, starting with uh, Charles of the Ritz, the Charles of the Ritz bottles, and then going to Parfums Corp, and then Sanofi, and then the Gucci PPR era, and then on and on and on. But um, this is a Sanofi bottle, and... Um, I got this from Anuj at Enchante, and I don't know if he still has any left, but if he does, it's a good buy if you're looking for a fresh, citrusy, um, easy-to-wear summer fragrance. This has this uh, bitter opening, so it's kind of bitter grapefruit with bitter lemon and some mint, and, you know, it's really hard to do a mint fragrance that doesn't fall into the um, toothpaste realm, right? So you have uh, Frederick Malls, um uh, Frederick Malls, Geranium Pour Monsieur, that's a good mint fragrance. You have Cartier's Roadster, that's one of my favorite mint fragrances, if not my favorite. And you have YSL Live Jazz. There's very few mints I can really point out to and say, man, I really like that as a mint fragrance. This is one of them. This also has this coriander heart with rhubarb leaf. And the rhubarb leaf makes it very unique. Uh, but it does dry down to this designery, cedary, woody, you know, vanilla-y, ambery thing that um, is not going to blow you away. If you're someone like me that likes wearing the heavier scents, this could be a little boring at times, but when it's super hot out and you want to be weather-specific, let's say, uh, Live Jazz is beautiful. It's a beautiful wear. So, Live Jazz comes in at number 14. Uh, number 13 is a uh, masculine version of one of my favorite fragrances of all time. Very hard to pick the top three for me. Uh, top three or five, let's say, from YSL, because they had some absolute gems. Uh, the, the bottom of the list was a little bit easier to rank, but at number 13, this one is called Opium Pour Homme. Now, this is the Eau de Toilette. I would love to get my hands on the Eau de Parfum one day, the Eau de Parfum has been discontinued for a long time, and bottles of it are crazy expensive. I just, I, I refuse to pay. I'd rather just not have it than, you know, pay three, four, five hundred bucks for it. But um, if I could find a bottle for two hundred, I'm, I'm for it. I'm, I'm down to pay two hundred, but I won't pay, you know, three, four, five hundred bucks. I just won't do it. Uh, but I'd love to have the Eau de Parfum one day. So Opium Pour Homme came out in '95. And it's considered a spicy oriental fragrance is how I would describe it. Of course, or opium is the women's version, which will be much higher on this list. Is um, Opium for women is, is one of the greatest orientals ever created, let's say. And this was created by Jacques Cavalier in 1995. And one of my beefs with this, one of the reasons why this is not higher, because as a smell, it's beautiful. It is a beautiful masculine scent. It has this um, star anise in the opening, which is perfect. I mean, if you like star anise as a note, if you like stuff like Lolita and Lampica, 
Old Masculine, you know, um, there's so many amazing star anise fragrances that we could talk about. Uh, if there's one actually coming up very soon in this list, uh, I think that Jacques Cavalier also had, had a hand in, but, um, you know, if you like, uh, L'Instant de Guerlain by Guerlain, um, if you like those kind of fragrances, uh, that use the anise note, this is right up your alley. I mean, this is traditionally masculine with a beautiful vanilla, you know, tolu balsam, resinous undertone and it's beautiful i mean it is it's the thing about it is that because this is an eau de toilette uh and it does have this fruity black currant too so there's fruity black currant is pepper and there's atlas cedar okay and the thing about it though is because it's an eau de toilette it actually wears pretty light it doesn't wear heavy like you would expect an oriental fragrance to wear that's why i really want the eau de parfum one day uh, or even just a partial of an eau de, of the eau de parfum, so I can talk about it on the channel and stuff like that. But it's very hard to find at a fair price. Um, but this wears light. So when I want a oriental, okay, but let's say it's hot, which is like nine months of the year here in Texas, this is the kind of stuff that I reach for. Uh, and so that's why it isn't higher. I wish this DNA was thick and real oriental, resinous, you know. And it, even though it has some of that in the DNA, it just is very light. It's much lighter than you would expect this type of fragrance to, to be. Um, but it is still good. If you don't mind reapplying like I do, I mean, you can see um, that I, I wear my fragrances. They're not just museum pieces for me. But uh, I, would, I would love to get my nose on the EDP and see if it would, you know, outshine the EDT, which I have a feeling it will. Okay, number 12. Uh, number 12 is an Anique Monardo creation, and it is also a flanker of one of the greatest YSL fragrances of all time. Uh, this one's called Body Koros. Okay, so this is the older bottle that has this strange stand on the bottom, one of the weirdest little bottles you'll ever see. Uh, and it has the cap, okay? So the older bottles have the cap like this. The newer bottles, have the built-in sprayer that looks like the Koros bottle, the actual Koros. And the older bottles say um, Body Koros. The newer bottles say Koros Body. Okay, so they kind of switched them around. Um, but this is an Anique Monardo. And it came out in the year 2000. Um, and uh, this is a sweet, spicy... Anique Monardo scent. I mean, the best way to describe it is it is an Anique Monardo through and through. It has that benzoiny, you know, spiraling uh, undercurrent of warmth that Anique Monardo does so well in so many of her fragrances. There's this camphoraceous like quality with this scent because there's eucalyptus, which on its own is camphor, has this camphor like vibe. Uh, and there's also camphor wood in the base. So imagine you have eucalyptus and camphor wood, but it's not off-putting or anything like that. It's a designer. So, and it's a 2000s designer, not a 1980s designer. Uh, and there's this beautiful frankincense note in the top. Lovely frankincense with Chinese cedar and mace. And it's a, it's a very enveloping, warm, welcoming fragrance. Um, eucalyptus is a very rare note to see. You don't see it used very often because it can have this medicinal like property to it. Eucalyptus can come across very medicinal. Uh, and here she used it extremely intelligently. You don't have to worry about, you know, this being too uh, medicinal to wear. If you want to smell eucalyptus more in its medicinal form, you could check out Creed's Royal Mayfair. That's an amazing eucalyptus fragrance. But this one is, um, you know, probably an easy starter eucalyptus scent. However, I must warn you that this bottle uh, is an older bottle, like I said, from whatever it was, 20, 15, 20 years ago. And so I don't know what the new bottles stack up to. I don't know what the ones with the built-in sprayers are like. Uh, I know Chris from Scentland talked a little bit about the ones with the built-in sprayer because he said he used to have a bottle like this. He used it up and now he's on to the one with the built-in sprayer. And he did say there are some differences, but it's still good. Uh, so just keep that in mind, you know, um, 
I'm talking about an older bottle. I don't know what the new one is like, but you know, if it's a decent reformulation, which L'Oreal always scares me, then I wish I knew so I could, you know, recommend it to people, but I, I really don't. Um, even with the sweetness, by the way, I should mention this too, because many times on the channel, I talk about how, you know, sweet fragrances really put me off. Anique Minardo does sweetness in a way that never puts me off. I've never smelled an Anique Minardo fragrance that I go, man, this is overdone or cupcake sweet or anything like that. No, uh, she does it in such a elegant, refined way where th there is sweetness and it is somewhat mass appealing, but it really never bothers me. It really comes across as sexy. So I like the way, I like her style for, you know, wintry scents. Okay, so next we've got number uh, 11. Body Chorus was number 12. So number 11, uh, I struggled with number 10 and number 11. I actually went back and forth multiple times and I finally settled on this. Um, and it was the Star Anise in the one that's going to be number 10 that put it over the top. But number 11 is what many would consider to be, actually I've got a little small, let me grab this here. So many would consider this to be one of the greatest masculines of all time. Uh, this is YSL Porom. So this is now unfortunately discontinued, believe it or not. They also have one that says Haut Concentre, which came out at a decade later. This came out in 1971. This is the one that Yves Saint Laurent, the man, actually went butt-ass naked for. He posed butt-naked in his uh, uh, advertisement. If you just go to Parfumo and type in YSL Porom, click on the one that says 1971, and click through the pictures, you'll see the, you'll see the uh, original ad from 71 when this came out where he posed naked. Uh, and, you know, he wore this. This was his signature scent for a long time. Uh, and it's a citrusy, fresh fragrance. Raymond Shailan created this, who also created Balenciaga Ho Hang, uh, which came out, I think, in 70 or 71 as well. I think I might like Ho Hang a little bit better th than this, but uh, they are both amazing fragrances, and they're both brothers and sisters. They're in the same family tree for sure. This has this uh, masculine lavender with bergamot, you know, petit gras, lemon, Lemon vervain, carnation, geranium, marjoram, clary sage, Brazilian rosewood, rosemary, thyme, amber, musk, patchouli, sandalwood, tonka bean, vetiver, and cedar. And when I did my Dior countdown, um, one of the things you may remember is that Eau Sauvage from 1966, which many people, and I know one of my subscribers in particular, considers that to be the best Dior of all time. I put it towards the back of my list because it's kind of just a boring citrusy cologne to me. I don't get the depth from it. I get the depth from this. If I had to wear, you know, one of these citrusy, spicy, fresh, um, masculine fragrances that focus on the citruses, Chanel's Pour Monsieur is another one that comes to mind. So if you took Chanel Pour Monsieur, if you took Dior's Eau Sauvage, and if you took YSL Pour Homme and gave me a choice, it's this one that I would choose. It's YSL Porom that I would choose. And I actually do have an older bottle too, thanks to Anuj. Uh, you can see the YSL up, you know, vertical logo and the 76% down here, 76 proof. Uh, and here you can see they have the newer YSL logo where it's actually written out like this instead of the vertical. If you ever see this bottle and it's got the vertical YSL logo, that's one of the original older bottles, I believe. It has this logo like this on the front. Uh, but this is still very good, and this is discontinued. So, I mean, if you can find a bottle with the built-in sprayer, I'd say go for it, no matter which version you can find. Um, but it is uh, it is classic. It's classic masculine. I usually wear these type of scents in the dead of summer. Uh, I like wearing these citrusy, you know, uh, especially these discontinued old-school masculines when it's really hot. I think the citruses really shine. You know, the spicy geranium and all that stuff tends to come through better uh, than in the cold. I usually won't wear these in the cold. Uh, and then, number 10, which just barely beat out YSL Pour Homme for me, uh, is another Jacques Cavalier. And this is from the year 2003. And this is uh, one of the ultimate barbershop scents of all time, okay? If you're a barbershop fan... 
uh, this could be number one for you. And this is called YSL's Rive Gauche Pour Homme. Rive Gauche Pour Homme in the sh metal shaving foam bottle. Very cool. Uh, and it's really the star anise. You know, uh, Jacques Cavalier used star anise in these two beautifully. Uh, this is just such a perfect, fresh uh, barbershop, spicy, fresh barbershop, clean, you know. Again, I usually wear this in warmer weather because the clean vibe, the freshly shaved vibe uh, that you get from Rive Gauche Pour Homme, to me, works better when it's a little bit warmer. And it's a shame this is discontinued because this was the perfect dad scent. I mean, you know, if you wanted to uh, think about a fragrance that your children will remember your smell by, this is like one of the best dad scents to me because it does have this comforting, you know, spicy masculinity with the star anise and lavender, two very traditional masculine notes, but it also has this shaving foam like vibe to it. I mean, the can literally looks like you're looking at a shaving foam can uh, and it is uh, fantastic. I mean, it's beautiful. I, uh, it does have some woody touches underneath. There's, um, Gaiac wood and there's patchouli, but I'd never find it like too heavy. Somehow they managed to keep it all very fluffy, very shaving foam like. I mean, there's really no better way to describe it. And with some vetiver. And that star anise and the clove kind of play off of each other as far as the spiciness goes. Uh, and it's a beautiful fragrance. I mean, you know, I don't know if this did very well or not. They This was around the Tom Ford time period when Tom Ford was the creative director for YSL. And, you know, him and Yves Saint Laurent, the man, butted heads about the future of the company. Yves Saint Laurent, the man, did not like the direction that Tom Ford was taking the house. And so they kind of uh, clashed a little bit. But uh, Reeve Gosh is one that was released under Tom Ford's tutelage, if you will. Okay, number nine. Uh, number nine is a is the only one on this list that I do not have a full bottle of that I want a full bottle of. Uh, it's just very hard to find, very expensive uh, because it is discontinued in these older bottles. Most people know what they have by now, but uh, this came out in 1964. This was the very first release when the house of YSL was created and it's actually called Y and it's the original Y from 1964 for women. Uh, and I have a little decant thanks to my good friend Rachel who sent me this and I've got some on the paper right here tonight. I have worn it to bed once before, but I have some on the paper and um, it is an amazing Sheepra. You guys know I love Sheepras. This is a spicy green Sheepra. It's so good, you know, it's, uh, I reviewed a fragrance called Civet by Zoologist, and I kept saying over and over again that while it is nice, it's missing that pop of the old school Sheepras, you know, that I've smelled from the past, and this has it. This has all of it. It has the animalic Civet that the fragrance Civet from Zoologist was missing. This has the Civet. It has the Oak Moss. It has the depth, it has the, I mean, there's so many parts to this and it's so complex, you know, it's so mysterious. That's what I love about Sheepras. They're mysterious fragrances. Uh, this is aldehydic, it's floral, it's fruity. Uh, the, the florals are gardenia, honeysuckle, hyacinth, jasmine, tuberose, and ylang lang, narcotic. This is beautiful narcotic florals. The, fl the uh, fruits are plum and peach. And there's little green touches, maybe little bits of galbanum. I don't know what other green touches. Maybe a touch of tarragon. It does have a slight anise quality at the top, so maybe it is tarragon. Uh, there's orris root, so it's powdery. You know, think about one of the biggest, grandest sheepers you can imagine, okay? Ambery in the dry down, benzoin, loads of real oak moss, and you can tell. I mean, it pops. It has that oak moss, the oak moss tingle as I would call it, you know, it, it tickles your nose. The oak moss, um, really feels like it's reaching in there and tickling your nose. 
it adds this depth, this texture that's missing. And you can see how passionate I get about these old sheep rows because this is what's missing in perfume, this. And they could do it in 1964. Why can't they do it today? I mean, this whole crap about banning oak moss is a crock of shit, if you ask me. Um, patchouli, sandalwood, styrax, waxy styrax with vetiver and, and the animalic civet is there, but it's not overdosed. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I would wear this. I would wear this to work. I would wear this to meetings. I would wear this on dates. I would wear this anywhere. I'd wear this being a dad. I'd wear this. I mean, this is a beautiful fragrance. Just an out and out stunning Sheepra. So, it's on my never-ending bottle list, you know, that just keeps growing. And it never, even when I tick stuff off, it never seems to decrease. Um, so that was number nine, YSL's Y from 1964. I do not see very many people talking about that. That deserves much more love, much more love, much more love. Um, so yes, I, I do have a, by the way, I guess I do have a sample of YSL Y EDP for men or, you know, the one that they sell nowadays in the blue bottle that I hate. Um, uh, but who cares? I mean, that's, that, that would have been below Libra if you ask me. Okay. Uh, number seven, sorry, number eight, that was, uh, number nine was YSLY from 1964. Number eight. And actually I think YSLY should actually be above these next two perfumes, but this is my personal list on the ones I like to wear. And so I put this here just because I have such a personal connection with these fragrances. Um, so this is, uh, M7 Oud Absolute. And I thought this was discontinued for the longest time, but Rich Mitch did a video today. He did one of these, uh, he calls it a fragrance rotation where he kind of talks about fragrances that he has worn for the week. And he said he went to the YSL counter and the woman there told him they're still selling this. They just keep it under the counter. You can't see it. You have to ask for it basically. Uh, but you may still be able to buy this at just department stores or, or YSL counters. I don't know. I thought it was discontinued for the longest time. Or maybe they just have a couple bottles and no one even knows they have them. But uh, M7, the original M7 is higher on the list. We'll get to it very soon. Uh, that one came out in 2002. This was the reformulation in 2011. And basically they did a couple things, okay? Number one, they added this mineral, these mineral notes to it. Uh, which I thought was very strange. Number two, they added uh, vetiver. There's no vetiver in the original M7. And number three, they added myrrh. Lots of myrrh. And I actually like the addition of the myrrh here. Believe it or not, uh, there's this extra orange-like quality too. It doesn't have as much of that booziness. So when you spray the original M7 from 2002, it almost gives it this fizzy cola-like vibe, which I really like. I love that fizzy cola vibe. You get it from Roja's Creation E Porom or Enigma Porom, depending on where you are in the world. You get it from Escada Magnetism and you get it from uh, M7, the original M7. You don't get as much of the cola vibe from this, which is why it's a little bit lower. But... Uh, I actually discovered this one first, you know, when, when my journey was just getting started. This is one of the um, first Oud fragrances that I bought, if you will. And um, I have a affinity for this, you know, even though it's a little bit different than the M7. that I definitely think the M7 from 2002 is better. I enjoy it more. There's no doubt about it. But uh, I still enjoy this. I still really like it. There's some patchouli in here. Uh, and there's some labdanum in the base, which keeps it kind of ambery. It's a good fragrance. I... I... Uh, would not overlook this. If you can't find the original M7, this is still a good fragrance to get. M7, Oud Absolute. Great designer Oud if you just want to kind of wear it, wear it out and about, you know. Okay, so next on the list, number seven, is a flanker of Jazz. And so we had Live Jazz at number 14. Now we have Jazz Prestige at number seven. And this is kind of turning into a little bit of a unicorn. I do have the box somewhere. I was going to try to show you the box. The box actually says 
Mysore sandalwood on it, interestingly enough. And this is a um, Parfums Corp bottle. Uh, and Jazz Prestige is discontinued, as is the whole Jazz line, which is an absolute tra travesty in and of itself. But Jazz Prestige came out in 1993. And of all of the two flankers, this one's my favorite because this one stays much more true to the jazz DNA, which came out in the late 80s. Live jazz, which came out towards the end of the 90s, is really Pierre Bourdon taking it, almost just creating a whole new fragrance. And they just use the jazz name, I think, to try to sell bottles and, you know, capitalize on the 90s fresh style, which Pierre Bourdon did very well. He had a natural fresh style after he created Koros. You know, after Koros, he just got obsessed with creating a new freshness. And, you know, he did stuff like Green Irish Tweed, Cool Water, um, you know, those kind of scents. And, you know, we'll do a whole ranked Pierre Bourdon video one day. But um, Jazz Prestige is a different perfumer. I don't think Pierre Bourdon had anything to do with this one. And uh, this is anise, bergamot. There are some fruity notes in here, which is a big difference from the original jazz. I don't think there's any fruity notes in there. Um, and the fruity notes in here add this playfulness to it, okay? So this is 1993, where people are really starting to get into the aquatics. You know, the late 80s had stuff like New West by Aramis, Cool Water by Davidoff. And then, of course, once the 90s came, it was all about aquatics, right? Uh, and so this is still trying to hang on to that old guard, that old 80s guard, which I love. You know, I, they're, they're my favorite type of fragrances. So, of course, I would like this. Uh, vintage lavender and caraway and rose, cinnamon, ginger, geranium, carnation, jasmine, cypress, amber, benzoin, oak moss. Um, maybe just a tiny touch of castorium because there's this leathery bit in the base with patchouli, sandalwood, and cedar. Lots of notes, as you would expect from an early 90s release. And um, many people actually compare this to a fragrance called uh, Vermeil for Men, which is uh, still kind of a cheapy. I think you can find Vermeil for Men for like 20 bucks. Uh, I, at least I got mine for 20 bucks a year or two ago or something. Uh, so if you can't find this or if you don't want to pay the big markup, this is a 50 mil bottle and it's a concentrated eau de toilette, which is, uh, you know, I think a term these houses came up with in the late 80s because I don't think men would have bought eau de parfum. Uh, parfum is for women. They wore eau de toilettes, right? Or colognes, right? So they came up with this concentrated eau de toilette for men. Interesting marketing gimmick they do. But, um... This is a good fragrance. It's just a little too playful. It has that, the fruitiness in the top gives it this playful vibe. This, um, you know, this is what I imagine like a college or a early 20s kid wearing in the, in the uh, early 90s, right? Um, because it does have that playful vibe to it, but it also has that traditional masculine vibe. So, I'm a little torn. It's just a weird fragrance, but there is the Mysore sandalwood in the base, and it is a very good it is a very good fragrance. I have to admit, I I do like it. So that is Jazz Prestige. Okay, um, number six on the list, and this is a newer fragrance for me, but I love it. I I mean, I've worn it to bed a couple times. I need to give it a full wear, but I know even just wearing it to bed, I just the DNA of the fragrance suits me. It's exactly the kind of fragrance that I love. It is a leather, uh, and it's from the, you know, uh, higher-end Oriental collection, or whatever they called it. That I think the whole collection is now discontinued. Uh, and this is called Noble Leather. I don't know if you can see that. Noble Leather. I, I hunted for this for years. Years and years and years I hunted for this. And the only reason I found it is because... Um, I kind of left a list with Mudasir, and I said, hey man, I'm looking for these. And he's like, yeah, you know, probably uh, I don't have any of these. And he's like, hey, I found a bottle. I must have bought it long ago and thought it was something else. And I was like, cool, I'll take it. And it's like half full. You can see it's like, you know, the juice is like maybe a little bit less than half full. I don't care. I'm just happy to have it because 
this is turning into a serious unicorn. And it came out in 2013. It's leathery and spicy with dried fruits. So it has amber wood, leather, dried fruits, vanilla, patchouli, and saffron. And um, the amber woods in here don't bother me. This is 2013, not 2022. So the amber wood phenomenon didn't really, you know, take off crazy. They're in here, but they're not like super overdosed. But what is overdosed is that leather with the dried fruits. And the, the vanilla is just kind of intelligently dosed just to give a little sweetness, just a touch, you know. But I really like this, really. But I, I'm a sucker for leather scents. And uh, maybe this is just an easy sell for me. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a big fan. This is apparently an old tester that Moudasir had purchased. But um, if you can find Noble Leather, I would recommend giving it a sniff if you're a leather lover like I am. It's really good. Really underrated. I guess it was competing with, you know, at the time, um, probably Tuscan Leather and stuff like that. And this is kind of what it was competing with. But uh, this is very good. I'm very lucky to have found even this little bit of juice that I that I did find. I think these are... What are these? These are 80 mil bottles. So this is like 40, 35, 40 mils of juice. Um, so more than enough for me to wear and love and talk about it on the channel. All right, so that was number six. So we're in the top five. Uh, top five. And number five is actually the original M7. And this is what the original M7 bottles look like. This is a tester, so I don't have a cap, but so what? Sometimes you got to sacrifice you know, caps to find juice, to find the real juice. And you can see the original release of M7 only had a short ingredient list because it was in the early 2000s. And you can see there was only a couple notes listed there. You've got bergamot, agarwood, which is oud, vetiver, and amber. So there was vetiver in this. I'm sorry. I said there was no vetiver in the original M7 when I was talking about the oud absolute. There was uh, vetiver but uh, there wasn't a patchouli note listed. Excuse me. And uh, there wasn't a rosemary note listed. There's rosemary in the M7 Oud Absolute. So they changed some things around. Um, but I think there probably is rosemary in here, even though it's not listed, because it does have, it does have that feel to it. You know, it smells like maybe there's some sort of herbal facet to it when you first spray. So my guess is there probably is rosemary, even though it's not listed. And um, there is uh, oud, vetiver, mandarin orange, uh, mandragora with amber and musk is the is the note listing. Uh, and you do get this, like I said, uh, there is a little bit of a medicinal, uh, almost like you're drinking or smelling a medicinal cola when you first when you first spray it on your skin. And I really do enjoy wearing this fragrance. Yes, it might be simple, especially for the ouds we have today. You know, this is uh, considered by many to be kind of the original oud fragrance, right? The, the fragrance that brought oud to the masses. And it, it flopped. It didn't sell well at all. Uh, it, it didn't sell. And uh, I think this is where Tom Ford and YSA and Yves Saint Laurent, the man, really kind of clashed because Yves Saint Laurent did not like stuff like this being released in his house. And he was saying, look, look at the sales. This is proving my point. And Tom Ford was saying, you fool, I'm showing you a new, you know, way forward. And then, of course, he took this DNA and created Oud Wood for Tom Ford, his own brand, and the rest is history. But... Um, Yes, M7 for me is a smash hit. I love wearing it, especially in the winter, but honestly, I'd wear that anytime. I wouldn't care. I'd wear that in the middle of summer. I love it so much. And then, number four, speaking of fragrances I love so much that I would wear anytime, anywhere in the middle of summer, uh, we'll, we'll put them all together. And this is the Jazz original release at number four. So I've got a baby bottle, 50 mil. And I have 200 mil backups because I love this so much. Just oh, so good. Uh, so, so good. And they just fit perfectly together. You know, they're meant for each other. They can just spoon each other. Um, jazz. I, I love jazz, man. What can I say? Even from the atomizer like this, I can smell it. Oh, God. You know, if you like uh, Safari, 
for Men by Ralph Lauren. If you like Escada Por Homme. Uh, if you like Heritage by Guerlain. Um, you know, it, jazz is probably right up your alley. It's amazing. It does have that, uh, you know, traditional masculine lavender. There's no fruitiness like in Jazz Prestige. It's just tarragon, coriander, anise, cardamom, nutmeg. It's spicy. And then it has that floral heart, carnation, geranium. There is iris here, jasmine. Uh, and then the base of leather tobacco. This, of course, made my tobacco fragrance list yesterday. Although the tobacco really shows up in the dry down. But it's definitely there with uh, oak moss. And, of course, these have the real oak moss in them. Tonka bean, cedar, sandalwood, amber. It's just, I love these type of fragrances. I could wear this sitting at home hanging out on a Sunday, uh, you know, watching my football team get slaughtered, or I could wear this to uh, one of the most important meetings of my life, and I would just feel at home in any scenario. There is just something about this DNA that just grounds me. You know, it just, it just, um, it just feels right wearing it. It just does. I mean, in, in any scenario, it does. I love this DNA. I'm, I am, I'm in love with this DNA, and I'm so glad to have you know the three tr original piano key bottle jazz. They're just stunning. I love it. I absolutely love it. Doesn't feel dated to me at all, at all. It, it feels like that's what men should be wearing, not the crap they're wearing now. Okay, number three. Uh, number three is the eau de toilette version of opium. And I do have two versions. I have the original with the built-in sprayer and the 80 proof. You can see right here. That's kind of a giveaway. This is what the original from 1977 looked like. And I think these were maybe made until, um, you know, 80, 83 maybe. But the original opium, I mean, what can you say about opium uh, that hasn't been said? It's uh, probably the best oriental of all time. Um, the fruity plum with that clove, the clove really pops on my skin. I get a lot of clove and, um, you know, the resins in the base, of course, the sweet myrrh, the apopanax, the myrrh, uh, the sandalwood. There is some castorium in the base. It's kind of resinous. There's labdanum and vanilla and tolu balsam, frankincense and cedar. And, you know, there's also some fruits to kind of, um, there's also some fruits to kind of balance everything out. So it's plum and peach and there's patchouli in here. Uh, but man, that clove and bay leaf in the top and oh man, just, just smelling it. Now I also have a bottle that's about 20 years old. This is what the one from 20 years ago looks like. And um, you can see it's a little different. It's not a built-in sprayer. It does have a cap. Uh, and this is stunning as well. Oh, God, just smelling it. I mean, what a fragrance. This is so addicting. I mean, it is. Opium is the perfect name. And I remember, you know, the bottle was... was um, Jonathan, on one of his recent videos, gave a shout-out to Pierre Denod, one of the, the greatest bottle producer of all time. He created this opium bottle, uh, and he created this opium bottle, and he created pretty much all the opium bottles. Uh, but... He created many, pretty much all of the uh, amazing bottles that you see are pure uh, Dinaud creations. But, um, you know, it was a big deal naming this after a drug. It was almost uh, like a, like taboo at the time. It was a kind of a scandal. Like, how could you name a fragrance after a drug? Like, proper high society won't have it, you know? And so that was when YSL was really in its heyday. They were making waves. Uh, if you look at the um, advertisements, if you just go to Opium and pull up the Eau de Toilette on Parfumo and you click through the advertisements, you will see actually a woman laying there on her back, you know, fully exposed, legs spread, looking up at the sky, and that was the advertisement. Nipple hanging out. I mean, they were taking chances back then. They were being risque, uh, and people loved them for it. You know, and what a perfect name for this scent. I mean, everything, you know, there are some fragrances that, um, like I mentioned Fahrenheit the other day when I did my Dior video. Fahrenheit, perfect bottle, perfect name, perfect advertisement, perfect fragrance for that, right? 
This is one such fragrance. Opium, everything was perfect. The name, the marketing, um, you know, the smell, they just nailed it. There are certain fragrances in history where everything comes together perfect. I think Aventus was one of those fragrances even. Uh, they nailed the marketing on that with Napoleon and all that stuff, the color scheme, the backstory, you know, uh, strength and power and excellency and, you know, uh, Napoleon on his horse when, you know, and, and I just think there are some fragrances throughout history where in time they are just perfect. Maybe they're not perfect fragrances, but they're perfectly created and marketed to their, their subset of the population that would be interested in something like this. And I will tell you, again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you are a man, please do yourself a favor. Do not let the fact that this is marketed towards women stop you. Do not. This is one of the greatest fragrances I've ever gotten my nose on, ever, 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 ever. There is um, a handful of fragrances where... If you said, Ramsey, please tell me which fragrances I have to smell if I'm new. I want to get a good understanding of, you know, the history of important fragrances. This would be right up there. You you could not understand uh, what a wave this made in the fragrance world. Uh, it was huge. It was gargantuan. So, Opium is um, in a league of its own. I mean, Rich Mitch and I were talking about Orientals the other day. We were talking about uh, 80s fragrances, I think, 70s, 80s. And I was mentioning Coco and um, Pietro Alla Scala and, you know, a couple fragrances like that. Uh, Ungaro Diva. And he was like, Opium. And I was like, dude, that's in a league of its own. You can't even put, you know, all of these other amazing fragrances. Opium is just, it's, it's opium. It's so good. It's in a league of its own. Uh, and then number two, uh, I actually put Opium Secret de Parfum, number two, which is what YSL called their um, Eau de Parfum back in the day. So the Secret de Parfum is what they called the Eau de Parfum. So we thought this was actually a different fragrance for the longest time. Both of these are Parfums Corp, I think. Can you see that? Parfums Corp. Is this Parfum? Yes, it is. It's Parfums Corp. So they're both Parfums Corp. This is 100 mil. Uh, and... Fuck. So the reason that this is higher, and I struggled with this, I also struggled to even whether I would make them different, but the reason that this gets just one notch up to me over the original Opium Eau de Toilette. And again, they could easily be, this could be number three, EDT could be number two. You catch me tomorrow, it could be completely different. But um, this is discontinued. Uh, and this still has the clove and, you know, indolic jasmine and, you know, narcotic rose and all this stuff and vanilla, patchouli, amber, benzoin in the base and all that stuff. But the myrrh here, the Apopanax, the Myrrh, and the Secret de Parfum um, is like Myrrh I've never smelled. I mean, it's literally like you're smelling Myrrh from a different planet. You know, it has that vibe to it. It has that, uh, it has that DNA, that, that, that Myrrh is, it will gobsmack you. It is so good that it will literally gobsmack you. Um... <clears throat> Uh, the benzoin in the base is amazing and oriental. It's a perfect oriental, but there's something about this myrrh, whatever it is, red myrrh, regular myrrh, sweet myrrh, I, I don't know. But when you smell the secret de parfum, the myrrh in here could be the best myrrh I've ever smelled, ever. And that's why I put it number two. But then again, the original Eau de Toilette is the original, so maybe this should be number two. I don't know, but I'm gonna leave it like I, like I originally put it. <sighs> maybe, maybe this should be. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I mean, some may argue it should be number one even, but there is a perfume from YSL that so transcends time for me, and is so important to my journey that I couldn't put it any lower. Um, and it is the granddaddy, YSL's Koros. <clears throat> this is a, um, 
Parfums Corp bottle. I don't know if you can see that, if it'll focus. Uh, this is the original Charles of the Ritz bottle. Uh, and look at the stain. Look at the civet stain. Fuck me, man. Oh, God. Uh, and these two right here are L'Oreal bottles, I think. These little 50 mils. And anything you can find with the silver shoulders, get. That's my recommendation to you. Forget L'Oreal, Parfums Corp, you know, um, Charles of the Ritz, Gucci PPR. Forget all that stuff. Just find some bottles with silver shoulders and you're good. Honestly, these are good. These right here are still very, very good. Um, the ones without the silver shoulders, the newest ones, they admittedly have been neutered, you know. Um, it's it's Koros without his armor. Uh, he doesn't have his armor on. He's a little more um, he's a little more vulnerable. But uh, I mean, this is uh, to me probably one of the greatest top three greatest masculines ever created. Uh, it has this animalic spicy, uh, and again, there's tarragon in the top, uh, aldehydic um, spicy uh, primal. That's the word for Koros. It's primal. It's like it touches a part of your brain that we can't get to in conversation or uh, in in. It's just like this ancient part of your brain, right? Koros gets there. The smell takes you to a place that maybe as a human being you've never known, but there is something from your ancestors that's hardwired into your brain that when you smell it, it awakens something in you. That's Koros. And it has this dirty, clean aspect to it. You know, it has this uh, animalic, you know, uh, it has this animalic need to recreate on one hand. And it has this uh, need to be clean on the other. It has this dirty, clean facet to it, right? Uh, and that's Koros in a nutshell. But if you want to break it down by notes, and Koros transcends notes to me, but it's aldehydes, bergamot, tarragon, coriander, clary sage, carnation, geranium, orris root, jasmine, patchouli, vetiver, cinnamon, amber, oak moss, honey, leather, musk, tonka bean, vanilla, frankincense, and civet. You ever seen um, cats? You ever seen a cat like smell the air. You ever seen like documentary shows of lions, right? When they'll try to see if the woman lion is in heat and they go like this and they like sniff the air, you know, like this primal need to recreate that's embedded inside of us. That's Koros. Pierre Bourdon captured something uh, that is in us that we don't even see or feel. We can't touch it. But it's there, you know, it's, 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 it's in us, it's in our, it's in who we are. Uh, and this fragrance is probably verboten today. Uh, this is probably looked down on today. I always laugh when I see these young reviewers and young kids on the internet make fun of this. Uh, and I get it. I mean, it's probably cool to make fun of this. Like if you're 16 and you smell this and you're like, oh my God, what, you know, and it's like, oh, what, who, they used to wear this back in the day? What a bunch of morons, you know, uh, while they're spraying on YSLY, right? Uh, just smelling like a, like just boring flat shower gel. And meanwhile, the real men are walking around just smelling like a, like a what? I don't know, like a, like a mystery wrapped in an enigma. You know, it's, Koros is, um... And the best part about it, okay, forget everything I said. The best part about this is this is a designer, okay? A designer house put this out in 1991. Uh, a mainstream designer put this out. There were kids just buying this at their local department store and walking around, you know, in junior high smelling like this in the old days. Oh, man. If I only had a time machine, I would go back. I would give up all the electronics I had and go back. I would. I would give it all up to go back to those times. They were they were probably better times. I bet you people were a lot happier back then. Um, but anyways, enough about that. That's my YSL countdown. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you agree, disagree. 
Let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know what your favorites are. Let me know if there's some YSL fragrances I should try that I do not have on the list. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I love seeing your comments and your feedback. Thank you for your support. Again, I've got the best subscribers in the world. Um, and like I've said many a times, even if I did not add another subscriber for as long as my channel was in existence, I would still be happy with where we are because you guys are awesome. And uh, I love how knowledgeable my subscribers are. So thanks for watching, everybody. Cheers, guys. And look forward to seeing you again tomorrow with another video. Bye now.